Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Uncivilized. Nah, this ain't Uncivilized. We back. Surviving El Chapo Season 2. This is the pregame for Season 2. And we are live. What up, y'all? We're back. We're back with the series that started it all. <clears throat> all right. Woo! Yes, sir, Rambling Zulu. It's going down. Season 2. Today we're going to cover the trailer, today we're going to cover a recap of season one, and today we're going to cover a bonus episode they put out about the cartel wives, Vivi and Val, fighting for their freedom uh, against the feds yet again. So that's where we are at. Zulu, I don't know what time it is where you're at, but uh, if it's the evening, hope you're having a good night. Uh, everybody else that checks in, much love, salutes. Um, for those that don't know, when I was starting this channel and, and trying to get monetized, I needed something to get the ball rolling. I needed, uh, I felt like single videos weren't doing the trick, and I found the Surviving El Chapo series that had freshly released at the time. And uh, I had been waiting on it for a while. It was something that I knew 50 was doing. Uh, I, I, uh, I had heard about his relationship with the twins before. And it was something that I was expecting to happen. Uh, I never expected it to be in podcast form, but it worked out perfectly. Um, and uh, season one was a success on this channel. That helped get the ball rolling really big and got me the watch time hours and the subscribers that I needed to, to get it going. Um, we had a good time. I had my opinions. Uh, a couple of people that we believe to be either... Uh, Either uh, Jay or Peter uh, came through and spoke. No guarantee that it was them. Uh, sometimes they agreed with what I was saying. Sometimes they didn't. Uh, it's understandable. When your life's on parade and your life is a movie. And see, it was already a movie, but now it's a movie that everybody gets to see and have their opinion on. And that's just what it is. Um, hopefully everything everything sounds good. Oh. It looks like my microphone just died. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me know in the chat, Zulu. One sec. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. We good. My bad. Y'all can still hear me. Uh... Rambling Zulu fun fact. Margarito Flores and El Chapo had the same lawyer. When the lawyer met El Chapo in the USA, he only told him after their third meeting, and El Chapo respected that. I mean, it's the same as gun runners. They're running, they running guns to both sides of the war, evidently. I would assume that that was a uh, conflict of interest, and, uh, and they were dead that, but, you know, I haven't got there yet. I appreciate you for the info, and thank you. Please drop that link. Uh, let's see what else we got here. All right, you can hear me. Everything's good. Appreciate it. He's the same lawyer taking on K. Flock's case. Nice. All right, we're going to see what he's talking about. I'm the real crooks. So, yeah, so we're going we're gonna to discuss these things. Um, again, you know, when your life's on parade, people have their opinions. You know what I'm saying? When you put out a life story, when people say, oh, it's based on a true story, you know, and they're all often not happy with how it came out. But uh, people are going to have their opinions, and it is what it is. And we'll recover my opinion as we go through this recap. Um, and who knows, maybe down the line when it's all said and done, we'll go see if I changed my mind on anything I had to say. Ah, so the law, it was a conflict. So in the trial, he could not cross examine Margarito Flores. So that's what's up because in this second season, this is what the Flores twins are going to cover in this second season. They're going to cover, um, the court case. You know what I'm saying? He's going to cover Chapo staring him down. He's going to cover all of, all, all of that stuff. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I enjoyed season one. I thought it was a good look. Um, do I think it was a puff piece? Maybe. You know, do I feel like... Uh, like maybe... Um, you know, they try to make themselves look like, you know... Just innocence purity you know what i'm saying 
I don't know who can hustle that hard and, and have innocence and purity in them. You know what I'm saying? Y'all went hard. Y'all blew y'all y'all blew the game up. Y'all had y'all had control of everything as far as who got the work, who didn't get the work. So it's like in a situation like that, you know, it's a criminal it's a criminal empire and in a criminal empire bodies happen, whether you want them to happen or not. The question is, did they just happen or were there a few bodies that you wanted to happen? Again, we're not here to crack no codes and we're not here to send nobody to prison. We're here to give our opinion on what we see. And that's it. Period. All right. Let's see what else we're working here. Uh, let's get some uh, Let's get some housekeeping out the way. Uh, we have $2 text-to-speech. Uh, $5 text-to-speech plus media reaction where you can send me a link. A comment for five dollars and I will watch the uh, video and you know give a reaction uh, only if it's not something that'll get me flagged off the internet you know what I'm saying so and then we got two dollar TTS so it's a text to speech so if you um, if you do leave me a text to speech message it could look something like this this is my generic big baller message it'll look like this Big Baller sent $1,000. I am the man. There you go. All right. Looking forward to that link, Zulu. Appreciate it. All right. So we got that. If you haven't hit the subscribe, please do. If you haven't hit the like button, please do. Um, we're going to kick it off with the... Uh, we're going to start with the, um, with the trailer. We're going to start with the trailer for season two. And then we're going to get into the... Um, we're going to get into the season one recap. So here we go. Trailer season one. For those that don't know, this is not a video podcast that they do. Um, this is a uh, this is an audio podcast. So the image that you see on the screen is what will be playing on the screen while we hear this, uh, this trailer, while we listen to this trailer. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Season two, Surviving El Chapo. Let's get it. I'm not no Mexican. Or a foreign monster. I'm your own monster. Born and raised in Chicago. There it is. That says a thousand things right there. I'm not your foreign monster. I'm your American monster made right here in Chicago. Born and raised. And that's facts. There's other monsters. There's other uh, uh, monsters from your old soil in L.A., in, in, in Indiana, in New York. They're everywhere. So... To sit here and say, ah, those foreigners. I'm not no Mexican or a foreign monster. I'm your own monster. Born and raised in Chicago. I'm Curtis Fitzsimmons Jackson. And I'm Charlie Webster. Join us as we bring you the epic next season of Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down a drug lord. There was no book on how to escape a character alive. I didn't think that we were ever going to escape out of this kind of unharmed. Season two picks up the story of Pete and Jay Flores, the twins from Chicago who became it's, America's biggest drug traffickers. It's almost a miracle that they came out unharmed. You know what I'm saying? So that was slick. Before escaping to Mexico and becoming right-hand men to the world's most powerful drug kingpin, El Chapo. But they found themselves faced with a choice, become El Chapo or cooperate against him. I remember when the plane landed, me looking out the window and I just saw nothing but police lights and lots of them. I think it was the first time I ever felt like, why are we doing this? Find out what really happened when they took their first steps on US soil after turning themselves in to the US government. It was just the beginning of a 14 year journey to turn their lives around. They're like, okay guys, it's gonna be all or nothing. It's time for you guys to finish doing your job. We need you to cooperate against all your customer base in the United States. I was like. So, making the decision to testify and go against the cartel is one thing. Uprooting your family, bouncing, having your women bounce and trying to get out the country on their own. Bouncing from a place, from a house, with all the workers that were placed with you, that have been watching your back, and you had to. Roll out on them, getting out of the country, you know what I'm saying? Trying to keep your family alive. And then 
Job ain't done. Now you got to sit in that chair. You got to look at that dude's face. You got to um, you gotta tell these stories. You got to implicate yourself. You got to implicate others. You got to roll over on people that you love. And then you got to go do your 14 years. Then after that, we're going to come at your wives and get them. And then we'll see what happens from here. But that's basically been the thing. The job ain't done. Now it's time to sit on that, uh, sit on that seat in that courtroom. Hell no. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. I felt like we just cooperated for nothing. Like, we have nothing. The government means it when they say it. If you're going to cooperate, it's all or it's nothing. Hear what it was like to go head-to-head -head against El Chapo in court. It was so ugly to be in that courtroom. I'm anxious and I'm worried and I'm sick to my stomach. He sits down and no matter what, when every time I look, he's staring at me. I bet. He's staring at me the whole time. He wouldn't. You got a, a ruthless dude that you know get people skinned on a regular basis. And he's sitting there staring at you because you betrayed him in a courtroom where he's fighting for the rest of what's left of his life. Stop staring at me. And we'll bring you right up to me. He's just staring at me the whole time. He wouldn't stop staring at me. And we'll bring you right up to the present day and reveal the shocking reason the twins' wives now face prison. Vivian and I are looking up to 10 years in prison. Do I think that the world will be a safer place because my wife is in prison? Do I have to answer that? Hmm. Join 50 and I to hear the next do I think the world would be a safer? I mean, we we could say that for a lot of people though, and I, I I get it. It's your wife. You can't answer the question, but we could say that for a lot of people. A lot of people that are in jail, like, is the world a safer place because they're in jail, or could they be out here doing something better, taking care of somebody who's not now in the system because um, they're in prison, or uh, Taking care of somebody or helping somebody, and you know, instead they're in prison over something that they probably shouldn't be in there over. So we can say that for a lot of people. Is the world a better place? Chapter of the Flores family story. Surviving El Chapo. Listen to season two on iHeartRadio app. Apple season Podcasts, two. Or with we will be right here talking our shit about it. I'm excited. I'm looking to see what they're talking about in the courtroom. I'm looking to see uh, what that was about. I'm looking to hear about the old man going back to Mexico, if they talk about that, why he went back to Mexico. Um, now we're going to get into the recap. Now we're going to get into the recap about um, about season one. Uh, Y'all know my, again, my stance, or not my stance, the story as it goes. A couple of guys born and raised in Chicago, father, a super hustler, um, Older brother, gang member. These guys get into the business. They go hard. They go fast. They become the biggest. They go to work for the cartel. They decide they're going to flip on the cartel because the cartel's in a kind of war that's going to eat them and their whole family. And, uh, again, they just went through the process that we spoke about. They flipped. They got out. They testified. They went to prison. And now they're back. And got intellectual property. Now, they're telling their story. 50 bought into their story. Did this podcast. I'm sure a TV show will follow eventually. Something. Um, here we are. So, let's let's get with this recap and see what they're talking about. If you haven't watched season one, I'll link the, um, the playlist to this. Um, and y'all can see what we thought about it. So, here we go. We're going to start the season one recap. Hey, it's 50 Cent. And I'm Charlie Webster. I know so many of you loved the first season of Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down a drug lord, and have been patiently waiting for season two. Don't worry, we got you. Season two starts next week. We got the real deal. This is the story of identical twins, Jay and Peter Flores, speaking to us publicly for the first time and their wives, Val and Viv. The Flores twins became the biggest drug traffickers in North America at 23, but they wanted to break the cycle and give their children a better life, a chance they never had. 
Now, if you watched the series, my aggravation came from kind of like the same thing Zulu saying in the chat. Uh, just playing the innocence. Like, it's a wrap, son. It's over. You know, now you're just trying to hide your morality. But, um, or lack thereof. Uh, but, um, my problem was just, they were, they were extremely smart for making such dumb mistakes. At the end of the day, it was always vanity. It was always wanting things that got them in trouble, as far as I'm concerned. Got them seen. They just opened up their safe for everybody to see what they had to, you know, what they had in there. That was my biggest problem with the whole situation. You know what I'm saying? Away from crime. The only way out was to turn themselves into the U.S. government and cooperate against the biggest drug lord of all time. A man who they saw as family. The real deal. Joaquin Guzman Loretta. El Chapo. The consequences of their decision start to unravel more than they ever could have imagined. Since we've been making this production for the last two years, this has played out in real time, as you'll soon start to find out in season two. Back in season one, right in the middle of recording in the safe house, the wives' lawyers called with some devastating news. It was the call that changed. So I wonder if they knew what was coming down the pipeline. You know what I'm saying? The wives. Or if genuinely they're sitting at a podcast telling about this extraordinary hustler life they had. And all of a sudden they get the call that they're on you. And now if it was like that, if they didn't know, that the, I mean they had to have known. But if they didn't, phew, the law's like, oh, y'all want to do TV shows? We know where y'all at. We know what y'all doing. We come and get that. But imagine that you filming a show and they're and like, oh, they coming against for you the biggest next. drug lord of all time. A man who they saw as family. The real deal. Joaquin Guzman Loretta. El Chapo. The consequences of their decision start to unravel more than they ever could have imagined. Since we've been making this production for the last two years, this has played out in real time, as you'll soon start to find out in season two. Back in season one, right in the middle of recording in the safe house, the wives' lawyers called with some devastating news. It was the call that changed everything once again for the Flores family. Now, Val and Viv find themselves heading to prison, 15 years after their husbands first turned themselves in. In season two, we will bring you up to date with the story of the Flores family, from the moment they were brought in by US authorities Listen, the United States government, just like they just said, they just said in the trailer, when we got back, they told us our job isn't done. It's time to testify. It's time to go sit in that seat, right? So the job wasn't done. They made them sit in those seats. Part of the job was getting them to not make no money and benefit from this, right? And make sure that they didn't hide no money. Their charges that the wives hid money, right? They're not going to let that slide. The United States government doesn't let anything slide. It'll never happen. It's part of, you You. You. You chose to play the game. You chose to get on this side. You got to give it up. You don't, they take time from you. And when face to face with El Chapo in the courtroom, all the way up to present day. Stay tuned to discover if the Flores family still feels the twins did the right thing and whether they feel it was all worth it. Hmm. Season two begins exactly where we left off. So here's a short recap of everything that happened on the last season of Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down Let's get it. Blood. Season two coming. Tomorrow. Listen, y'all, we on season two tomorrow. I don't know what time. If they put it on at midnight, then it'll probably be early. But, uh... Season two starts tomorrow, and I believe it's every Wednesday after that, and y'all can find me right there every Wednesday after that. Our introduction to, to the drug business started at that seven years old when my dad came home from prison. How long was he in prison for? Oh, seven years. It was a learning experience. 
I don't even think we thought marijuana was like a bad thing, right? It was like as soon as he got home, he was like back at it. Our home was raided by the Chicago Police Department. This is the police! Put your hands up! My older brother took the blame the first time. The second time they came, they're the ones that to take the blame for him. And that's when my dad was on the run. My older brother, he would sell cocaine out the house. We start meeting all kinds of people, you know, in his business. He sold, like, I don't know, two kilos of an apartment, and he was arrested by the DEA. And that left us in our situation that we depended on him. You know, he was our provider. Not so long after that, when we first got approached by his... He was their provider, but... He didn't, he didn't pay the bills. Like, you heated up the house. You got the house raided. You got popped off twice. And then when he was gone, they figured out there was no bills paid. There was no, you know what I'm saying? Like, what did he provide? Connect his drug supplier with the opportunity to, to get in the business. I'm 16 years old, 17 years old, and you know, there's $10,000 worth of bills on the table. I mean, working at Walmart wasn't gonna cover that. Three months into our drug trafficking career, we're making a million dollars. At 17, Jay and Pete had made a million dollars in cash. By 23, the twins were the biggest drug traffickers in North America. My brother and I, we probably easily pushed over 130, 140 tons since 1998. Work. February it's a lot of work. I hear my phone start ringing, ringing, and ringing. Were they? Three months into our drug trafficking career, we're making a million dollars. At 17, Jay and Pete had made a million dollars in cash. By 23, the twins were the biggest drug traffickers in North America. My brother and I, we probably easily pushed over 130, 140 tons since 1998. February 9, 2004. I hear my phone start ringing, ringing, and ringing. I remember answering my phone, and it was my sister, and she's like, P, hey, they're in the houses. They're in everyone's house. The feds. The feds are there. They're looking for you. They're looking for Jane. Don't go on. They're everywhere. And I remember that panic hit me. There's a warrant out for our arrest. There's an pending indictment out of Milwaukee. There's search warrants. That's not good. I remember crossing the border and just feeling so relieved to have crossed that border into Mexico. It's a vow, Jay, my older brother, and his wife. They come pick me up. We're like, just so happy to see each other. Like, okay, we made it out. I had myself on mute, I tweaked. So like I was saying, um, Jay and uh, Jay and Val happened to be on their honeymoon when those raids came down. I feel like Peter feels like the, the, the brother that caught the ass end of the stick. Like, you know, he was the one that was on the run while they were in Mexico chilling. They were getting raided here in Chicago. Um, he was the one that got kidnapped couple times two or three times um and i feel like there's a point of contention between the brothers about how it always seems to land on one of the brothers heads and the other one seems to be in a nice plushy situation when it goes down my apologies for the mute i'm uh trying some new shit over here we'll see how it goes you know it was a mess and little by little i was gonna kind of fade out and stop doing that, like stop selling drugs. And did the opposite happen? Yeah. The brothers fled to Mexico as fugitives with their wives, Val and Viv. And despite not being on the ground, 
their drug business just continued to boom. Pete's wife, Viv, explains that things got more and more chaotic. It was just so much going on, so many different people coming in and out the house, different cars, Jay with his hundred phones, Pete with his, I mean, it was just overwhelming. And then Pete was kidnapped in Mexico. My older brother called me to say, bro, they just called. They said that they have Peter kidnapped and they want $10 million. They brought me to a small room, like a cell. And there's no windows in there. They have a bed in there. I was just happy that I'm still alive. So I get another call from someone else. He said, we're telling you have your brother. You guys owe Chapo Guzman. $10.8 million. Mind you, this is not the this is not the first time that Peter got kidnapped. Peter had gotten kidnapped before by the guy that, that his brother said was or that he, he recognized the name Saul. That's the name that they used in the uh in the podcast. They used the name Saul. He had got kidnapped before. And uh, I don't remember the outcome. I believe they paid the money. Something to that effect. Yeah, they made the decision to pay the money or something. And they got him back. This is the second time. Now, this time, if you ask me, they were trying to kill him. Uh, this was the time that their quote-unquote uncle kidnapped him. And then told Chapo that they owed him Chapo's money. Which was a big lie. Ended up being a big lie. My best friend, Tommy... I call him right away. When I told Tommy that Chapo has Peter, he's like, let's go to Culiacan. We're gonna get your brother back. We arrived to this like farm. There's planes, a bunch of small Cessnas. We start walking and there's a pilot, this tall skinny kid wearing flip flops. Yeah. He has to be 16 years old. That's his everyday life, he, flying that trip. That's his life. He, like, opens the door, and I'm like, this is not right. And I sat down, like, oh, my God. And as we're kind of on the plane, we're going to big peaks. Like, the plane, I feel like something like the, the trees are going to just, like, rub the belly of the plane. And it was this big mountain we were kind of heading towards. And, and now I'm really, really scared. I'm like, what the fuck? We land. I'm kind of getting off. Everyone's just looking at me. We come up the stairs and realize it's a big old palapa. It's huge. There's tables. I see that there's like these picnic tables. There's a bunch of newspapers. And then someone have to pull the face in the front of it. And I look and I could see his hat. And it comes up so slowly. And I see him. I mean, he looks at me and he kind of does a second take. He reaches out his hand and he's like, Paul King Guzman Loera. I tell him my name, Margarita Flores, Margarita Flores. He kind of stares at me and I'm kind of trying to like, give him back my hand a little bit. And so, how can I help you? I said, Well, look, um, I'm here because they killed my brother. I don't owe that money and I'm here to see if I could work something out to, for my brother. <laughs> well, he said, I'm sorry to say, but that money's owed to me. And I'm not going to forgive that debt. And he said, there's no money that's worth losing your brother. I just lost mine. And I would pay whatever it is to just get my brother back. What kind of, what kind of demonology is that? The guy's trying to convince you to pay him his money. <coughs> Or else he's going to kill you. And he uses the fact that he just lost his own brother as a selling point. <laughs> it's a different kind of devil right there, boy. And he said, when you come back, we could do business. You could come work for me. I could give you drugs. And we could keep making money together. So I started collecting money, started making payments. The next day, um, I get a call early in the morning. So he says, hey, listen, your brother's not well. And he said, and everything that you know, I've known of you seems like you're, you're a man of your word. 
And that, that says a lot. Now you give me your word that you're going to pay me back my money and I'll let your brother go today. And think about all of these things. Like, you'll say, oh man, 10 million is a lot of money. But man, bro, they could have killed him at any moment. They so tired of waiting for their money, they're ready to send buddy back to you and be like, don't worry, I, we got an IOU on you. You know, you pay that big. Got to. Like, I remember when we got up and you know, off the truck and we just hugged and kissed. He was like, I thought I was gonna die. And he was like, what happened? And I was like, I'm a chapel. Premiering tonight on CBS. I can make it dangerous. Life lock identity. Favorite sports with the king of sports book 537. Is ultimately changed drastically. El Gam to 5334. The meeting with El Chapo to free Pete is ultimately what led to the twins becoming part of the Sinaloa cartel family. Hmm. This is what changed everything, as Jay's wife Val describes. Their life changed drastically overnight. So she just said. And there was just so many new people around us and. Who's gonna protect us better than the biggest drug lords in the world? They welcomed us in with open arms. In the mecca of drug lords, in present time, the drug lords that, that we know about is Chapo Mayo. At that time, we were important to them. We had access to more drugs, I think, than anyone else because of who we were as in our personalities, how we carried ourselves. I think that was a turning point. We're at the table with the biggest drug lords, and they love us. And with that comes power and protection. Power and protection and celebrations and... For how long? A life that... How long did it last? And was the parachute always there? You know? It's nothing to go into a business and say, ah, oh, shit gets hot, I just bail out. You're going to have to pay one way or the other. No one could have dreamed of. But a life at the top of the drug game isn't all it's cracked up to be. We were at the top, right? Things are getting taken from me. Not just that I was going through hardships, that was maturing. I was under, starting to understand like the destruction and everything that was doing to me and to the family. And, and starting to understand that what we were doing wasn't the right thing to do. Like, And we could sit there all the time and say, oh, yeah. I don't hurt anyone. I don't kill anyone. I'm, that didn't matter. I don't hurt anyone. I don't kill anyone. I don't put bags on no one. I was watching TV and this documentary came out about John Gotti and the mafia. It just said that you know, Sammy the Bull had received five years for 19 murders. First Sammy the Bull. Against John Gotti. And the infamous Sammy the Bull. Never thought it would be Sammy the Bull that inspired this move. That's for, that's for a fucking fact. Never thought it was going to be Sammy the Bull that inspired this move. Again, I always thought it was, you know, some crazy. And it was. Metaphorically, it was a gun in the mouth moment. But I thought it was, you know, you, you're looking for some movie shit. You know what I mean? That wasn't it. Sammy the Bull. Sammy out here doing podcasts too. I remember thinking to myself, wow, he got five years for covering against John Gotti. In my head, I was like, and who the fuck is John Gotti? The people we were dealing with, I felt like was living John Gotti's whole life each day. I woke up in the middle of the night and I do call it an epiphany. It was this moment of just clarity. I could cooperate. <laughs> I think we would have to do some prison time, but we'll have a chance to change your life. Yeah. Sitting at home and thinking about it, and thinking about really just wanting a way out, man. Just wanting a way out, wanting a way to just be there for my family, give them a different way of life. I wanted a better life for them. The only way out was to cooperate against the man they now saw as family, Joaquin Guzman Luera, El Chapo. But first, Jay had to convince his brother. Peter, he shows up 
him and me get show. Hey, I said, come in the washroom, come in. In the bathroom. In the bathroom. And at that time, we have a really huge shower. It was like a 12 people shower. And we have all these jets. And it's like, I don't know, 16 shower heads. But when the shower heads were going, you couldn't hear anything. I turned on the shower. I said, listen, if we know we could give them anyone they want. And if, you know, Samuel Buru got five years for 19 murder for a corporate and it will be in a good situation. So I'm just thinking at worst case that we could get 10 years. I don't no. think none of us want the life that's coming for us. And I think that this will be our chance for us to change our life and do something different. But we're going to have to sacrifice. I said, well, we need to talk to our attorney. How are we going to do that? You know, like, me and my brother both looked at Val. The attorney? When I flew into Chicago, I went to his office to go see him. And I just sat down in his office and I'm like, listen, this is really important. You can't say anything to anyone. I said, Jay and Peter, they're thinking about cooperating with the U.S. government, and we're going to need your help. The attorney first told me that he actually was able to reach out to an agent, and he says, I'm going to put you on the phone. His name was Sam Ginelli. Sam Ginelli. That's going to be the first agent we ever talked to. The first handler. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I gotta talk to people higher ups and see how we could do this. You guys are doing the right thing. You're coming out to the good side. Right Good before way. we hung up, he said, "Welcome to Team USA." Team Welcome USA. To Team USA. Welcome to America. Now you're on our side. That hurt. I was like, Team USA. And I was, you kind of made me think, like, what team am I on? And I felt like that was the biggest moment where I felt them, like a, a traitor, like right there just talking to him. And I said, look, man, I'm looking to make a deal, but I'm looking to make the best deal you ever made. He said, I got three people for you. And I told him again, I got Chapo Maya and Arturo He tells me, the one thing I could tell you is that what would be the most valuable thing you could do is start, if you can, documenting some of these conversations. So I went to Radio Shack and bought a bunch of recording devices. Now, for those of you that watch season one, y'all don't know that this little uh, tape recorder technique, they didn't get that tape recorder, tape recorder technique from the, uh, they didn't get that tape recorder technique from the government. They didn't get that tape recorder technique from the agents. They got that tape recorder technique from Chapo himself. When they first had the meeting with them, about releasing Peter from their uncle. Chapo, they told Chapo that this dude was lying on him, and he said, "All right, go get a tape recorder and give me some proof." So Chapo was on the wire, was on the whole wire game before everybody. He put these guys on the wire game. I'm meeting the feds. We kind of get into the conversations. I remember the first thing I talked to him about was like, "Look, I have, I have a lot of information for you guys, but." I need to be reassured. I need you guys to know that I want, I want to promise that, that no harm is going to come to my family, that you're going to promise to keep them safe and that, that nobody in my family will be prosecuted for any of the crimes related to my drug trafficking. And Good luck with that. Like, you think we give a fuck about your family? Yeah. What we need is a solid case on Chapo Guzman. And Period. we could get him with a recording that leads back to a drug seizure in Chicago. I promise you the best deal. You can ever imagine. Like you get the best deal the government has ever given up. And I was like, that's it? I was so nervous. Now, of course, to make the recording, but of what was to come. What did this mean to my life? Like, it was an ugly feeling, you know? Getting the recorder out. And the only thing the feds had given me, like, a earpiece with a microphone on it, you know? When you put the phone to your ear, you could hear it, and then they could record. I remember putting it to my ear and like the secretary answered. I'm what like, a oh, trash setup. The twin. <laughs> United States government. They're like, all right, take this Bluetooth device and this Bluetooth device and put them together so you can hear everything properly. Real, real outstanding setup. Wonder where all that money is going. Amigo, buenas noches. Buenas noches. ¿Qué dice? ¿Cómo está? Bien, ¿cómo le va? Bien. And I'm like, 
I don't even know what to say. I remember him saying amigo, like hearing his voice again. Amigo! ¿Qué dice, oye? ¿Cómo está? Bien, bien, lo saludaste. ¿Cómo estás, tu hermano? Todo bien, hombre, aquí. Lástima que no me tocó verlo el otro día. Ah. Era mi hermano. Pero ahí estamos a la, ahí estamos a la orden, ya sabes. Sí, oye, todo bien. I thought, okay, it did, but I had to get over that. That was like a big moment, you know, I remember thinking, like, this is my ticket home when you get it. Two weeks after the chapel recording, you know, we get a call, it's a Sunday. Our attorney wants to talk to Think about that, you, again, you you recorded a, a drug lord that, is, that skinned a million dudes and you recorded him for the first time, the first successful recording on him, and you got to wait two weeks before you even talk to anybody. Just sitting there wondering if he knows. It's early, right? And he said, you know, the U.S. attorney wants to talk to you. He said, he wants you guys to turn yourselves in today. Today. Reality just hit us. So you already did the recording. It's been two weeks. That two weeks should have been puro planning, man. Puro figure it out. But nah, none of that. Y'all, y'all got caught with some. We gotta go now, and your parents were down. I thought, okay, I did. But I had to get over that. That was like a big moment. You know, I remember thinking, like, this is my ticket home. One day. Two weeks after the chapel recording, you know, we get a call. It's a Sunday. Our attorney wants to talk to us. It's early, right? And he said, you know, the U.S. attorney wants to talk to you. He said, he wants you guys to turn yourselves in today. Reality just hit us. Huh? What? I didn't want to say goodbye to it. It was scary to think that I could, like, lose, like, my family and everything. It's a wrap, son. We jumped in the truck. Two agents. Did you guys bring the recorders? I'm like, yes. And we were emotional. It's okay, guys. You guys are doing the right thing. And they started driving towards the airport. Didn't take long for us to fly out of there. The twins were put on a private plane and escorted out of the country by the feds. The rest of the family were left to fend for themselves. Val had to step up to get the family out of Mexico alive. Again, they had zero plan. That shit annoyed me. You got this much money, it was, there was never plans for kidnapping and for, and for paying ransom, no money put aside for that. And then you know that you're turning on the biggest cartels in the world and you know that you just recorded the, the numero uno head honcho and for two weeks you know that at some point the feds are going to say, extraction, we got to get out of here. And at no point did y'all plan anything. So now it's up to... Val to lie and scream and cry in front of the people there that ain't supposed to know that y'all getting out of there. And, uh, and, and, and she also has to, you know, fend for everybody else. Vivi balled up and froze up and everybody, they had all these problems. They didn't have a plan. If it was, if, if Val wasn't who she is as a person, they would have never made it out of there. JMP left. He knew like there was just no plan for us. It looked like this whole, like, entourage. And we had to drive 12 hours to get to the border. We got to pass through all these towns. We look so fucking crazy, and it's the night. And we drove through the whole night. We didn't stop. And we drive up to the border, and we get there. And they ask us for our papers. And I'm giving them my passport and giving them my kids' papers. I was like, the first one to get there. And they're like, hold on, hold on. Everyone gotta wait. I was like, no, we can't wait. We gotta go in. And I'm like, they're gonna kill us. They're gonna fucking kill us. I said, we have to get out of the country. We have to get back to the U.S. We're U.S. citizens. And at that point, I knew, I just knew this was our life. It didn't matter. Whatever JMP did and cooperated, I knew at that point that they were gonna always look at us like criminals. I knew it. And I just, I felt like we made such a huge mistake. A whole bunch of them. Right. Took the last step. 
and I just like stretching out my legs a little bit and my brother gets gets behind me and he's like, okay. And they're like, all right, turn around. I said, excuse me? He said, turn around, put your hand behind your back. And it hit me. They put the handcuffs on us. That was weird, like, my brother and I looking at us like, this is it. Cause they're like... It hit you when you put the handcuffs on. It hit you when you recorded them. It hit you. What didn't hit y'all was to pack a bag for your family. From now on. No. Handcuffs and shackles. Just keep telling ourselves that we're doing the right thing. We end up flying into a small airport right out north of Chicago. I remember when the plane landed, me looking out the window and I just saw nothing but police lights and lots of them. We taxi and when the door opens, it's cold. I remember stepping a foot outside the airplane and Home standing home. there and I just see the sea of like blue jackets. Welcome to Chicago. Like DEA, US Marshals. Everybody. And when I saw the cars and like all the agents and marshals just like staring at us, I think it was the first time I ever felt like, holy shit. What? First time you felt like what? And then I just see the sea of like blue jackets. You probably still won't understand. Like DEA. Was I will say this, the audio mix on this interview was trash in and, and season one also. Well, that is season one, but I'm hoping in season two it's better, I doubt it. Marshals. And when I saw the cars and like all the agents and marshals just like staring at us, I think it was the first time I ever felt like, holy shit. What? I didn't hear shit that he said. But whatever. Deep in air out. Season two starts Wednesday the fourth of October. It's going down. Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down a drug lord, season two, is hosted by Curtis Fifty Cent Jackson and me, Charlie Webster. Produced by myself and Jackson McLennan. Assistant producer and research support by Casey Hertz. Edit and sound design by Nico Palella. Theme music and original score by Ryan Sorensen. It's exactly so that's the recap on one on season one. Again, they bounced. They ended up in Chicago. He saw the sirens. I like to see footage of that. We see the footage of uh, Chapo getting dragged off the plane. Wonder what's up with that footage. But uh, they made it out. They made it out. The family barely made it out, but everybody made it out. Um, we thought that was going to be it, but we got season two, and season two is going to cover the court case. Season two is going to cover the testimony and maybe some of their jail time. Maybe they got jail stories to tell. Who knows how protected they were? Who knows what they had to do to protect themselves after that? Um... Yeah, season one was a uh, it was a hell of a story. It was a hell of a story. A lot of ups and downs. Definitely made for Hollywood. It's a Chicago story. It's a little village story. Now we're gonna get into the bonus episode, the Flores wives sentenced to prison bonus episode of Surviving El Chapo. Um, for those that don't know, they've been so. So when they did this deal, it was their business to turn everything over and give everything up to the feds, all the money, whatever, you know. And uh, evidently they didn't. Supposedly the wives had some money stashed. They were spending lav lavishly while the husbands were in prison. Um, and supposedly they were getting the money back and forth through their through the twins' older brother. And it turns out that the older brother flipped and testified against the wives. So now the U.S. government is trying to get the wives for another 10 years. You would think that they wish if they were going to serve 10 years, they'd have served it while their husbands were serving their 14. So now it's a whole separation deal. They were separated them from them for 14. Now they're back. 
I don't know if they're all still together. I guess they are. But now these two might have to go away for a bunch of years. And uh, it just seems to never end for these guys. You know what I'm saying? Is it the price to pay for the game you play? You decide. All right, let's see what's up with this bonus episode. Flora's wife sentenced to prison. Hi, it's Charlie Webster here, host of Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down a drug lord. I know you guys have been waiting for season two, and I've got some really good news. It's coming out next week. But as we've been put... It's coming out tomorrow, and I'll be playing it right here and reacting to it right here, so... Make sure that you guys got your notifications on. Hit the sub button. Hit the like button. I'll be covering it. If it, if it drops at midnight tonight, it'll be up first thing in the morning. Uh, or maybe I'll just go live at midnight. I don't know. But I, I don't know what time they're going to release it. So I'm playing that by ear. After that, we'll know. And then every week, it should be a regular thing. Uh, but, yeah, it's not a couple of weeks away. It's tomorrow, October 4th. Season 2, Surviving El Chapo. The podcast that started it all on this reaction channel the finishing touches together on the new season a huge development just happened and i wanted to bring you up to date if you remember whilst i was recording with the flores family in the safe house they found out that jay and pete's older brother armando had cooperated with the feds to provide evidence that implicated their wives so val wait, and viv in a huge development just hanging out the twins then? who brought down a drug lord I know you guys have been waiting for season two, and I've got some really good news. It's coming out next week. But as we've been putting the finishing touches together on the new season, a huge development just happened, and I wanted to bring you up to date. If you remember, whilst I was recording with the Flores family in the safe house, they found out that Jay and Pete's older brother, Armando, had cooperated with the feds to provide evidence that implicated their wives, Val and Viv, in a money laundering conspiracy. That got to suck. There was a lot of upset in the house. I bet there was. You find out Big Brother, the caretaker, is, uh, the caretaker is, um, is, is flipping and, and, and telling some stories, so... That had to suck. They sitting there doing their interview. They're like, yeah, surviving El Chapo, 50 Cent. Oh, yeah, he was our, he was our, uh, what'd they say? He was our, uh, he took care of us. He didn't pay the bills. He got the crib high. He did all, that guy just been bad decision after bad decision. But everybody seems to keep being okay with these bad decisions. And the realization that the wives might end up serving prison time. The information Armando gave was related to the Salute so 30 North. Found out that Jay and Pete's older brother, Armando, had cooperated with the feds to provide evidence that implicated their wives, Val and Viv, Dirty. in a money laundering conspiracy. Dirty ass there was Armando. a lot of upset in the house and the realization that the wives might end up serving prison time. The information Armando gave was related to the twins' drug debts that were collected when Jay and Pete went to prison back in 2008. The debts were outstanding money that was owed to the brothers for drugs. It was collected by Val, Viv and Armando. Some of the money was handed over to the government, but there was more that the government claimed they didn't know about that Val and Viv used to live off. The government indicted Val and Viv in 2021 and not just live off they didn't live off campbell soups you know what i'm saying they was they was out and about living that cartel wife life last year the wives filed a motion to dismiss the money laundering charges arguing that they were promised immunity as part of the twins cooperation deal a hearing was held and judge matthew Canelli spent two days listening to evidence from both sides he denied the motion to dismiss the charges. The wives were left with the choice to either go to trial or plead guilty. Partly due to a concern around negative public perception, the wives decided not to go to trial and pleaded guilty. On July the 17th, Viv was sentenced to three and a half years in prison 
and required Ooh. to pay a 504,000. You got off easy. $858 forfeiture. On July the 17th, Salute to also. I the motion to dismiss the charges. The no, wives were left that. with the choice to either go to trial or plead guilty. Partly due to a concern around negative public perception, the wives decided not to go to trial and pleaded guilty. On July the 17th, Viv was sentenced to three and a half years in prison and required to pay a $504,858 forfeiture. How much? Wait a On Monday the 20th... I keep, getting, I keep thinking about the 18 months she's going to end up Viv doing. Viv was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. What's the money? And required to pay a $504,858 forfeiture. <laughs> On Monday the 25th of September... Forfeiture? They still got a half a million dollars under that porch? Y'all wildin'. I'll head to the courthouse in Chicago for her guilty. On July the 17th, Viv was sentenced to three and a half years in prison and required to pay a $504,858 forfeiture. On Monday the 25th of September, Val headed to the courthouse in Chicago for her sentencing. The government had requested a five-year sentence. Instead, after hearing Val's testimony, Judge Kennelly gave her the same sentence as Viv, three and a half years in prison and a $504,858 forfeiture. I jumped name. on the phone with Val on Monday afternoon, straight after her sentencing. How are you feeling? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm just, um, I feel like I'm just glad it's over with. I needed it to be done and I just yeah I'm so happy I just I got it over with but I feel like I I don't know it, it's bittersweet right it's better than that and, 10 years um I'm just happy that it, you know I got it over with you know in court I apologize to my children you know for the pain I caused and I just regret putting them through this again I've been through so much already especially with their dad being away for all them years and having to go through that. So, you know, now it's like, I feel like it's different when it comes to mom, you know, especially since they've had me for so many years and I kind of had to be mom and dad when Jay was away. And so now it's like, I won't be there and I just feel like it's going to be really hard for them. But I feel really blessed with the time that I did get, because I got three and a half years, and I feel like that was a blessing for me. Damn right, it's a blessing. I'm really just trying to be positive, and I just want to, I really want to put this behind me, and I know we're going to get through this. I know that, you know, our family is very strong, and I feel like our bond is unbreakable, and I think that, you know, it's only going to make us stronger, and I know one day, we can definitely put this behind us and finally just start over and, you know, with our new lives. What it's life is that? Lot. What's it's the new life? It's definitely a lot. And What's the new life? The new life is a new hustle and then what? No fronts, driving around in Bentleys, open door on the safe, letting everybody know what you got. I hope y'all learn some lessons. Maybe y'all should open a McDonald's franchise. Y'all understood that part. But at the end of the day, I just feel like it makes us stronger. I feel like we grow. We've grown so much um, from everything that we've been through. Good. And I feel like I just wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't gone through all the ups and downs and all the struggles. And I feel like I do realize, I do realize the mistakes that I've made and I do honestly um, understand why I got the three and a half years and um, I feel that when I was in court, just listening to the prosecutors and listening to the judge, I do understand and I do take accountability for my mistakes for sure. And I did take accountability for 
money laundering. Okay, what were the mistakes? Was the mistakes going on the lavish vacations? Was the mistakes the lavish whips? Was the was the mistakes just, you know, <clears throat> coming down in lifestyle? Because guess what? After all of that shit, y'all should have been surviving on Sambo, uh, uh, Campbell Soups. At least for a couple years. You wouldn't have had these problems. But now, three and a half, you'll end up doing 18 months. You're going to have to pull 504000 out your ass. But and I did say that this is what I did. And I think that care. was... And I don't Very mean a couple of drug deals. I mean like a couple of movie deals. A couple of movie deals. Because I tell you what, like them or not, like their story or not, they have a story. You know what I'm saying? The twins have a story. And Val has a story on her own. You know what I'm saying? That she can sell her life rights. To the judge, I do understand. And I do take accountability for my mistakes, for sure. And I did take accountability for money laundering. And I did say that this is what I did. And I think that was very honorable for me to get up there and gracefully <laughs> say that, you know, everything that I'm being charged with, I did do that. Oh. However, I did believe that I had immunity. And so I think that that made the difference, whether the government agrees with that or not. That sounds just dumb, though. You, you believed you had immunity. After that immunity, you were still laundering money. The immunity is for past situations, not future situations. You know what I'm saying? So I think you got it a little fucked up. I disagree, but at the end of the day, as far as, far as the crime I committed, I did difference whether the government agrees with that or not. Or just gonna agree to disagree, but at the end of the day, as far as the crime I committed, I did definitely money launder, and I did say that in a different understanding of what I was doing. And to be honest, Charlie, I just hope that, like, by sharing my story, you know, I just want to bring awareness to like other women that have like walked in my shoes and that have who Val that are going through this and who's walked in your shoes, you're living Val. That life. Who has walked in your shoes, Val? By sharing of what I was doing. And to be honest, Charlie, I just hope that, like, by sharing my story, you know, I just want to bring awareness to, like, other women that have, like, walked in my shoes and that have, that are going through this. And sometimes you're living that life and it's, like, a really fast lifestyle, right? And you don't realize, um, you don't realize the consequences that comes with this life. And I think that, you know, I'm hoping that they, you know, other women can make better choices than I did because I feel like I did make a huge mistake and I just what was it? feel bad that, you know, my kids are going to suffer because of it. And I feel regretful that, you know, they're going to have to go through this all over again because they've been through so much already. What do you think now about the fact that the government pursued you like this? Um, to be honest, Charlie, I feel like I was really upset. I felt like I was being targeted. You were. I felt like, um, I felt like they wanted to make an example out of me. They did. Which is hurtful. Why? The prosecutors that are in They're not charge friend. today of the case. You know, I just like they're doing their job. Yeah. And I know that if they were, you know, the prosecutors back then, when my husband was um, was cooperating, I feel like things would have been a lot different. They would have looked out And I feel like everything would have been a lot more clearer to the point where I wouldn't have made certain decisions and I wouldn't have made these bad choices. Really? And okay. So, um, now, I'm not upset and I'm not mad. I'm not. Yes, you are. We've gotten to the point where, again, we're still, after she just took accountability, now it's everybody else's fault. Everybody else didn't hide the bread underneath it. If you wanted to make a deal, make the deal. What y'all tried to do was y'all try to play both sides against the middle. That's cool because, as far as I'm concerned, fuck the government, fuck these other guys. You know what I'm saying? Fuck everybody. But. 
You was playing both sides against the middle and you lost. That's the part you're upset about. You're part you're upset about losing. Angry. I honestly do understand that this was not okay with them. But I feel like it's different today than what it was. I wish that the prosecutors today were there back in 2008 because everything was like everything was smoking mirrors, you she know? She missed the old case. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're speaking just after your sentencing, so I can imagine it's not really... I don't know how much it sank in, but how do you feel about... And how are you going to cope with prison? Is there anything you've thought about? And has it come up in your head about your own safety? And definitely, Charlie. Like, when I was in court today, it's like we had to put on the headset and they had to basically, you know, blur the channel so no one could hear what the judge is, ta- what the judge is saying to us. And there was things that need to be taken out of my report that had to be redacted, of course, where I would be serving my time was definitely one of those issues. Um, But I must say that it is scary, more so of just the fact of being alone. And I think that's what scares me, you know, just... You know, it's it's really hard to just, you know, do your time alone. And I think that's the part Vivi going with you? that scares me the most. Even working with you and, like, just having these hard conversations. I was never used to that, Charlie. And I think that by doing so, I was able to really open up and tell my story and I think it really made a difference so. so you mean to tell me you didn't tell your story when you wrote the book Cartel Wives that wasn't your story this is, yeah, the story does continue this is a whole nother sit your ass in that jail for 18 months and write the next book and make a couple mil and that'll pay off that 504,000 decisions decisions life 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 and I think that in season 2 of our podcast I think that you know, the listeners are going to hear a lot more of our stories in depth and hopefully they too can understand, you know, what we've been going through. Nope. They might not agree, but at least they'll understand our journey for sure. Nope. There's so much more to the Flores family story. Join us for season two as we take you on the 15-year journey from the day the twins handed themselves in right through to now and find out how they got to this point. 50 and I are really excited to share the new season with you. Make sure you hit follow to be notified as soon as it drops on October the 4th. In the meantime, we've just dropped a little episode in your feed so you can catch up on everything that happened last season and check out the trailer for a sneak peek at the new season. Can't wait to see you on October the 4th. Can't wait to see you either. All right, y'all. It's going down tomorrow. Keep an eye on the community tab. I'll be, uh, as soon as I know what time I'm going to go live, uh, I'll put it on the community tab. Y'all check that out. Again, if you haven't subscribed, please do. If you haven't hit the like button, please do. Uh, Salutes to Old 30 North, Old Soul, and Rambling Zulu in the chat. Appreciate you guys for being here. Uh, season two tomorrow, October fourth, surviving El Chapo, the podcast that started it all on this reaction channel, um, and and basically got us monetized. So uh, let's see what happens in the courtroom. I'll holler at y'all. Y'all have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Be safe. Holla.